Praise the Lord. We rise up as we pray together to prepare ourselves for the Bible study tonight. You want to prepare your heart and your mind so that the best the Lord wants to give will reach out to your heart today that the study of your word or the word of God will be a great encouragement but born strength to spiritual life. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord. That God will give you the wisdom to think about your eternity. And God will help you to have a serious mind, scriptural desire, a mature disposition That you yield yourself to the word of the Spirit. As the Lord Himself reveals His might through His word unto you. Pray that God, in his love and mercy, will show you your true, real, spiritual condition. And his spirit will help you with abundant grace. To be able to live a consistent Christian life pleasing unto the Lord. That your mind, your eyes will be upon the Lord himself. He will be the one you desire. You desire to please. Pray that God will also help you in the application of God's word to your heart and your life. And the word, like water, will cleanse you, wash you clean. Remember the prayer of Jesus Christ, sanctify them through thy truth. The word is truth. Pray that the word of God will have its divine purpose in your heart and life. That this word will make you a true disciple indeed. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free, free from sin, free from any sin, any bondage. That will hinder you from living a life pleasing to the Lord. 
set you free for his glory to do his will set you free for his service and thereby set you free for eternal rewards Pray that God will give you a humble spirit. With appropriate yieldedness to the word of God. Ask for grace Sufficient grace Abounding grace That will make your life Righteous Pure, holy Devoted unto the Lord Abundant grace to help you. Be obedient to everything the Lord reveals in His Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us together as your children. We thank you for visiting us who are visiting us for the first time. Lord, we pray you give the appropriate portion to everyone here tonight in Jesus' name. Our friends, our brothers, our sisters, our leaders, our workers, and all the people that are meeting together to share with us in this same Bible study all over this city and all over this state and all over the nation and also the continent of Africa and beyond, Europe, America, everywhere. Lord, we pray that your spirit will teach every one of us and reveal the truth to every one of us to stand on our feet spiritually and to be able to live confidently, courageously in the word of God in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that the terrible sin that Belshazzar committed and those kings of full committed, you have to rebuke them when it was too late for them to repent. Lord, we pray ours will not be like that in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you give us spiritual backbone to be able to courageously declare the word of God any time, every time, to everyone. We have to do it in Jesus' name. The spirit of fear, timidity, cowardice. Lord, we pray, get out of every heart in Jesus' name. The boldness to be a Daniel in our generation.
And to be able to speak forth the word of God for every brother, every sister, every child. Oh Lord, give unto us in Jesus' name. That through us many will turn to the Lord and repent. And that they, the converts, and we, the believers, the teachers, and so winners, will be able to stand together on the truth of the word of God in Jesus' name. Lead us into the depths of the knowledge of the truth that will strengthen our hearts and lives, even tonight. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We come back to Daniel chapter 5, and now we're looking at verse 18 all through to verse 24. Already, if you were here the last two Mondays, we have studied how Daniel was called eventually, so that he'll be able to read and interpret the writing on the wall, the mystery which no wise man in Babylon could read, which nobody understood. The king had offered great rewards to anyone who would read the divine sentence, but no one had the needed spiritual inspiration from above to make known the mind of God. At last, Daniel was brought in, and the king made the same promise of promotion unto Daniel. Daniel was not interested in such a promise. Daniel was not interested in money, gifts, rewards, prosperity, promotion, whatever, because he was not a prophet for money. Like many other people, he was not seeking earthly gain. In fact, we are told uh, something terrible about the prophets and the priests and the preachers at the time of Micah. And the complaint was this in Micah chapter 3 verse 11. The prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us, and none evil can come upon us? Even though Daniel rejected the king's offer, his gifts, his reward, he still committed himself to revealing God's mind to the monarch, that is to the king Belshazzar. Ministry was essentially for him a service unto the Lord, not a mere duty unto man. That brings us to Daniel chapter 5 verse 17, which we already saw last week, but look at it. Daniel chapter 5 verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself. Would to God that there will be people of courage today and people of spiritual stamina today and people that have spiritual backbone today that will be able to look at a monarch, a king, a prince, a ruler, anyone face to face, eyeball to eyeball and will be able to say like Daniel, let your gifts and your rewards be to yourself and give those gifts and rewards to another. Would to God today there will be people who are not interested in just money, in just rewards. Would to God today there are people who are not interested in just earthly gain for their service to the Lord, but they know that they are called of God and commissioned of God. And because they are called and commissioned of God, they want to do what needs to be done without the attachment of Gain, reward, remuneration, appreciation of man. Daniel said, Daniel answered and said to the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself. We're living in an age when people want to do whatever they do. They want to do for money. They want to do for rewards. They want to do for earthly gain. And we need people like Daniel today who will rise up once again and know that they are called for ministry. And it is not because of his earthly reward. It's not because of earthly gain. They just know that this is what you do. And they want to do it for the glory of God. And then he said, yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. He said, yet I will. Those three words, I want you to keep them in your heart, in your mind. Yet I will. No gain, yet I will. No salary, yet I will. No human appreciation, yet I will. 
And there is, uh, there is nothing that is coming as material gain on this yet. I will. In fact, those uh, three words are so important. You need to chase them in the Bible. That is, you want to follow after the people that said, Yet will I, or yet I will. For you to understand, Daniel was not the only one. The only one that knew that to serve the Lord is the greatest privilege here on earth. And it doesn't matter whether any material gain is attached to it, whether prosperity is attached to it, whether promotion is attached to it. There, there are people that know that whatever is happening, they will say, yet I will. I'm looking at Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Habakkuk chapter 3, 17 and 18. Although the fig tree shall not blossom. In our language today, is just saying, although the economy is down, and the crops are not coming from the farm, and the jobs are not there, and un unemployment is rising high, and then people are suffering materially, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the field, in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The the flock shall be cut off from the folds, and there shall be no, he, no herd in the stalls. Listen to verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Yet I will, with the spirit of Daniel, or the back bone and the assurance and commitment commission consecration of daniel although the things i expected to happen is not happening although i do not have the gain i wanted to see although the economy is down although unemployment is rising high although i don't even have a job now although the things that people call prosperity is not in my hand and it's not in my home yet i will to have the spirit of daniel and the attitude of Daniel and the disposition of Daniel, the commitment, consecration, commission of Daniel. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will, I will joy in the God of my salvation. I'm sure you remember this man that is called Job. You know what happened to him, how he lost all his cattle. I lost the children, how those calamities came in quick succession against his life. And that's the time many people will give up and you say, I don't know whether I still want to follow the Lord or not. I don't know whether I still want to hold on to my integrity or not. I don't know whether I want to still hold on to the doctrines of the Bible that I believe or not. In fact, the wife said, are you still holding on to your integrity? Cause God and die. And yet I, I find those words for coming from his mouth. Yet I will. I want a challenge for you and for me that whatever may be happening around you, whatever may be happening very close to you, you'll be able to keep those three words. One, two, three. Yet I will. I'm looking at Job chapter 13, verse 15. Job chapter 13. We're looking at verse 15. It says, Though he slay me. Oh, he said, I don't think I've seen anything yet. It's not touched me yet. It's not killed me yet. Yes, I've lost children. And yes, I've lost my cattle. And yes, I've lost my servants. And yes, I've lost many things. But if it goes beyond that, do you know there are people that if a little problem happens to them, they cannot evangelize again. A little thing happens to them. They cannot do the will of God anymore. A little thing happens to them. They cannot serve the Lord anymore. But Job said, though he slay me, he said, yet will I trust him. The same words, yet I will. Like Daniel, keep your gifts to yourself. And keep your rewards to yourself. All those things do not motivate me. And he said, I'm not in the ministry for money, for, re for gifts or rewards. He said, yet I will. I will interpret it. For, I'll read it to you. I'll tell you the mind of God. And Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But I will maintain my own ways before him. That's commitment. That's consecration. That's absolute surrender. And that is the evidence of the experience of sanctification. That your serving the Lord does not depend upon the things you see or the things you hold. It depends actually upon your relationship with the Lord. God's faithful servant shall always despise the gifts and the rewards of the world. 
Our eyes, our hearts are set on better gifts and rewards. Let us do our duty and render our service as to the Lord, not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. That's in Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, with unwavering commitment. We read and we interpret God's writing to sinners and to saints alike while we count the world's rewards as mere trash and, and trifles, worthless draws and dung. However, before reading the inter- the, and interpreting the writing on the wall, Daniel rebuked the king for neglecting the signs and the warning of divine judgment. Please understand at this time now, uh, Daniel was uh, beyond 70 years of age. And Daniel was now an old man. This Belshazzar, although he was a king, he was just a little boy compared with Daniel. And Daniel, even though the man had the title and the position, Daniel knew a prophet is greater than a king, the king of Babylon. And the messenger of the Lord, that has the word of the Lord, is higher than anybody having any position in the world. And he, he, he was speaking for God. And the man, Belshazzar, was only representing Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon. And therefore, the man, Daniel, with the understanding of who he was, a prophet of the Lord, he stood before him. And number one, before reading the writing, he said, I'll come back to the writing. I need to speak to you. You are careless and you are negligent. You've seen what happened to your father, Nebuchadnezzar, and see the way you have lived your life. He rebuilt that man because Daniel saw that he should have seen the dealings of God with his father, Nebuchadnezzar. Those dealings were intended as instruction and warning for all in Babylon and all on the earth. Belshazzar's failure to take the instruction or heed the warning brought the indignation and wrath of God upon him. God's judgments on sinners in the past deserve as instruction and warning for each of us today. That's why we're told we're going back to Micah again. Micah chapter 6 and verse 9. It says, The Lord's voice cries in the, unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see his name. Hear the Lord, and who has appointed it. And that's the reason he first of all started with this rebuke of instruction. And then let's see those words in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 6, rebukes of instruction unto the profligate king. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23. For the commandment is a lamb. And the law is light, and the reproofs of instruction are the ways of life. Rebukes, they have their place. Reproofs have their place, and corrections have their place. That's why Daniel, first of all, rebuked the king before interpretation. Now we come to read the text for today. We're looking at Daniel, Daniel chapter 5, verse 18. O thou king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him, whom he would he slew, and whom he would he kept alive. And whom he would he set up, and whom he would he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his mind had inch in pride. He was deposed from, it, from the kingly throne. From his kingly throne. And they took his glory from him. Verse 21. And was driven from the sons of men. And his heart was made like the beast. And his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the most high God ruled in the kingdom of men and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. Verse 22, and thou his son, O Beshazzar, 
hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. That was the real point. You knew everything. And you knew what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, that Greek king, your royal father. And yet, with all that knowledge, you've still done what you have done. But thou but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of his house before thee. And thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold of, of a brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are thy, all thy ways, thou hast not glorified. Then was this part, the part of the hand sent from him, and the writing was written. We're going to look at the study tonight under three components, three parts, three sections. Number one, recounting and reviewing lessons from past judgments. Past judgments, what had happened before. Daniel reminded Belshazzar. And then he recounted, he reviewed those things so that he'll come back to his senses for the short time that he still had to live on earth. Number two, rebuke for refusal to learn. Refusal to learn. Rebuke for refusal to learn from perceived judgments. When you have seen, when you have heard, when you have perceived, when you have known all the people that were judged, that were punished for the iniquity, for the rebellion. And for the evil that he committed against the Lord. And you still go and do exactly the same thing. That's refusing to learn. And there is punishment for refusing to learn from perceived judgments. Number three, recompense for reprobates living under perpetual judgment. Recompense for reprobates living under perpetual judgments. Number one, recounting and reviewing the lessons from the past judgment. Then he reminded El Belshazzar of the dignity and the dethronement of Nebuchadnezzar. He reminded him of his royal father. He recalled his father's haughtiness and humiliation. He reminded this man, Belshazzar the monarch, reminded him of Nebuchadnezzar's soaring pride and of his supreme punishment. And Nebuchadnezzar eventually learned an unforgettable lesson, but his son, Belshazzar, had forgotten. And he went on in inexcusable pride and profanity. Before the divine wrath fell on Nebuchadnezzar, he behaved insultingly and insolently towards God. As he grew in power and honor, he increased in pride and haughtiness. And then Daniel said, you have seen it already in that verse 20, but when his heart was lifted up, verse 20, and then his mind was hardened in pride, then Daniel said, you know what happened after that? He was deposed from his kingly throne. And they took his glory from him. At the height of his power and his glory, he feared not God, neither did he regard any man. That's why that judgment came in the, in the form of a strange punishment. Number one, he was deprived of his reason. Why? Because... He wasn't thinking of the Almighty God. He was not reasonable enough to worship the Almighty God who had given him that reason. Therefore, he lost his mind and he lost his majesty. Number two, he despised God and his glory departed from him. The Lord had given him the glory. Everything you have, what do you have? The Lord has not given you. And when you despise God, God, you belittle God, you look down on God, in pride you exalt yourself against the almighty God, then he removes from you what he had given unto you. Number three, he is for his degrad it's degrading life, descending below the normal man in abominable tyranny and oppression. He was given, he was driven from the sons of men. For his heartlessness, number four, Making no proper use of the heart of man. You don't need the heart of a man. Because of that, his heart was made like the heart of the beasts. And then number five, he was wild in character. 
is dwelling there was with the wild asses or the wild creatures of the earth. Nebuchadnezzar was under divine wrath and judgment and indignation until he knew that the most high God ruled in the kingdom of men. That was the purpose of the punishment, the purpose of the chastisement, until he will know that the Most High ruled in the kingdom of men. Look at verse 21. And was driven from the sons of men. And his heart was made like the beasts. And his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven. Here is the real thing you need to underline in your Bible. Until, till he knew that the most high God ruled in the kingdom of men. And that he appointed over each whomsoever he will. And that's the lesson he needed to learn. But not only Nebuchadnezzar, everybody was to learn that. The intent or the purpose for the punishment that came upon Nebuchadnezzar was not just Nebuchadnezzar alone to learn, or Belshazzar alone to learn, for everyone to learn, for you and I to learn. That when you exalt yourself and you disregard and disobey the word and revealed will of God, that God is still on the throne and it will prove to every creature and every man that he is God. He wants everyone to learn the lesson which Belshazzar failed to learn. Look at Daniel chapter 4 verse 17. Daniel chapter 4 verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, that is the angels who are watching over the affairs of men, and it demands by the word of the holy ones till the angels, to the intent, to the purpose, that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basis of men. And then now Belshazzar was rebuked because he did not learn the lesson he ought to learn. I pray you will learn the lesson. We will learn the lesson together. And then we'll live in such a way that God will be glorified and God will be exalted. I will not have to learn the lesson the hard way like Belshazzar had to learn it. And let's look at the past judgments of God and let's understand God has not changed. God remains the same. Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 26. Deuteronomy chapter 29. We're reading from verse 26. For they went and served other gods and worshipped them. God whom they knew not, and whom he had not given unto them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land, to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this book. Do you see that? The reason why judgments come, why punishment comes, is because of people living an unrighteous life. A wicked life, an evil life, a sinful life. And it says, learn it already. You don't have to do that again. You've seen other people putting their hands in the fire and they were burnt. You don't have to experiment. You withdraw from the fire because you know it always brings judgment. In fact, it says in verse 28, and the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day is because of judge, if it is because of their punishment or because of their sin, the punishment comes upon them. I have a question for you. Does such a judgment come upon somebody who is not a church member? Somebody who is not a child of God? Somebody who does not have a Bible to read? Does God punish the sin of the people that don't have any preacher to preach some doctrine unto them? Yes, you better believe he does. Because he rules in the affairs of men. Sodom and Gomorrah did not have a Bible. And when they sinned, judgment came upon them. The Amalekites did not have a Bible to read. When they sinned, when they sinned, judgment came upon them. The Egyptians did not have a Bible to read. And when they sinned, 
judgment came upon them. And then Nineveh, judgment was to come upon Nineveh until Jonah went there. Yes, he does. He brings judgment upon everyone. You know, there are some people that say, I'm not going to go to that church where they're teaching too much of the Bible because if I don't hear, then I'll be free. No, it doesn't make you free. It's like if you say, I'm not going to read all those road signs and I'm not going to read all the traffic things because I don't want to have accident because I can speed and since I'm ignorant, I am ignorant of whatever happens when you speed. I'm ignorant that the police people are there. I'm ignorant that this is the judgment that will come upon somebody that does this. If you do it, the judgment will still come. And if you drive in the wrong way, the accident will still happen. Whether you knew or you didn't know. Let me show some people that didn't know in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth unto thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Who are those nations? Those are the Gentiles. They didn't know the truth. They didn't have a preacher. They didn't have a prophet. And then it says, There shall not be found among you any that maketh a son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth the benition, observer of time, so an Chanter, or a witch, or a, ch or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or wizard, or a necromancer. Listen to this now for all that do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. He drove them out, they didn't know the truth, they didn't have a preacher. They didn't have a prophet. They didn't have any priest. They didn't have any evangelist. They didn't have any Bible study leader leading them or teaching them the word of God. But when they did the wrong thing, the judgment still came. That means that if you have, if you say you're ignorant and it's, that's because that's why you're doing what you're doing, the judgment will still come all the same. Let's learn from what happened in the past. We're looking at First Chronicles chapter 10. First Chronicles chapter 10 verses 13 and 14. So Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord. What are we learning here? Whether it's a poor man or the rich man that says God is above all. An intelligent man or a foolish man that says God is above all. A man exalted in position like a king or a man that has no position and is dwelling in a hut on the ground, sleeping on the ground. God is a great God. He judges everyone. Here is the first king of Israel. And even though he was the first king of Israel, we're told for his transgression he died, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. This is somebody who had even known the truth before. And are totally exterminated and totally wiped out all the witches and familiar spirit people in the land. But eventually when he got into problem, the things he had destroyed. He went to that again. Isn't that what happened to some people when they were younger? In their Christian lives, they were serious and zealous, fervent for the Lord, and then they destroy things they ought to destroy. And then after that, when they begin to grow cold and lukewarm, and then there are some challenges and problems, then they go back to the things that they left before, and judgment comes. And the Lord will not say, well, he was fervent before, he was serious before, he was committed before, he was yielded before, he was obedient before. When you turn away from your faithfulness of the past, and then you go back to the things you had abandoned, the judgment will still come. Galatians, I'm reading chapter 2, verse 18. Galatians chapter 2, verse 18. I'm waiting for you to open the Bible. This is such an important verse of Scripture. Galatians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 18. It says, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, 
I make myself what? A transgressor. That's what happened to Saul. When he became a king in his zeal for the Lord, he had totally cut off all those that had familiar spirits. But eventually, he forgot how to pray. He was only chasing an enemy. His life was totally now committed to just running after David. He left his own life, not watching. He left his own family, not watching. And he left his own relationship with God, not praying again. All he wanted, the only thing he wanted to do now is commitment, his assignment. Everything he followed after was just to get this David. And when you deviate like that, you are not taking care of your life anymore. You are not concerned about your quiet time anymore, about prayer anymore, about following the Lord anymore, about living for the Lord, about having grace, the grace of God in your life anymore. The only thing you are committed to now is that you are chasing one David and one David and one David, chasing him and chasing him. Even the assignment the Lord has given you to do, you abandon that. All you are looking for now is chasing after David. Eventually, there's things you let before, the hatred that you repented of before, the restraint you made before, you go back again to pick up your vomit. I pray it will not happen to you. Then it says, for if I build, if I build, the things again which I once destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. And that's why the judgment came upon that man. We're looking at First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. I've shown you already in the word of God that if you are ignorant of the truth and you commit sin, judgment will still come. And if you know the truth, you knew the truth before and you commit sin, judgment will still come. We need to learn from that because that was a failure of Belshazzar. He did not learn from what he had observed that his father had done. In First Peter chapter 4 verse 17, for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it falls, begin at us. What shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? It's saying the judgment will start from the house of God and will be kind of judged and examined by everything that we have known. And it says, if the judgment begins with us, how much more the people that do not obey the truth and if the righteous castly be saved... Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Luke, we're looking at Luke. He's telling us we need to learn from what God had done in the past. If you know the truth, follow that truth. Believe that truth. Accept that truth. Lay by that truth. Watch your life by that truth. And make sure that you're standing in line with that truth that you know. Otherwise, judgment will come. If you don't know, find out. If you don't know, study. And come to the Bible study. Because your ignorance of the word of God is not going to excuse you from the judgment when the time of judgment comes. I'm looking at Luke chapter 12, verse 40. I'm reading from verse 46. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 4 to 6. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him. And at an hour when he's not aware. That's what happened to Belshazzar. The Lord came and wrote on that wall at a time. He wasn't expecting. I will cut him in asunder. And will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. I pray that will not be your Lord. Look at verse 47. And that servant, and that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten. How? With many stripes. Looks like that's talking about me, that's talking about you. We know so much Bible, and we know so much of the will of God. We know so much of the demand requirement of God on our lives. I cannot pretend. I don't know. Of course I know. You cannot pretend. You don't know. Of course you know. And it says, the man, the woman, the servant that knows his master's will. We know the doctrine. We know what he requires. We know what salvation is all about. And we know what the new birth is all about. 
And we know the consequence of that new birth. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. We know about sanctification. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And we know about the power of the Holy Ghost helping us, energizing us, equipping us to be able to stand and to give us the courage, the courage of a Peter before the Sanhedrin. And we know of the one man and the one wife. And we know of the things we need to do going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You cannot say you don't know i cannot say i don't know and it says in verse 47 the servant which knew his lord's will and prepared not himself neither did according to his will it says shall be beaten with many stripes well then how about if they don't know I about if they have not learned. I about if they don't know the chapter and the verse in the Bible. And then they commit what is worthy of punishment. What will happen to them? Verse 48. But he that knew not. He that knew not. And that's not an excuse. He that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, unto him shall much be required, and to him to whom men commit much of him, they will ask the more. I pray God will help us to learn what we need to learn. Give me a good amen. We're looking at Daniel chapter 5, verse 22. Rebuke for refusal to learn. Rebuke for refusal to learn from perceived judgments. Rebuke for the refusal to learn. We're looking at Daniel chapter 5, verse 22. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thy heart, though thou knewest all this, wait a moment, here is Daniel. He was even a stranger in the land. You know what Belshazzar, what Belshazzar said? Belshazzar said, are you that Daniel of the captivity that my father took away from the jury? Yes, was a foreigner there. And yet, although a foreigner there, he was the mouthpiece of God, the prophet of God, the servant of the Lord. Right there. And it wasn't cringing. He wasn't a coward. He wasn't looking down. He wasn't shaking. He wasn't afraid of what they might do. And what a lesson for every servant of God. What a lesson for every preacher of the gospel that with firmness and with purpose of heart and with commitment to God will be able to declare the word of God without fear and without favor. He gave him the needed rebuke. And that's what the preachers of today, that's what we need. That we're not just a kind of shaking and trembling and, and we're trying to put our hands in our mouth and trying to modify what we say, what the word of God teaches when we come before men and women or before children. Anywhere we find ourselves that God will give us the courage of Daniel. I say God will give us the courage of Daniel. Wonderful days, the good old days when deeper life members will stand up in the bus and they will declare the word of God without looking at the face of anyone. Wonderful days, good old days when deeper life members will stand up in any village, in the village square and then declare the word of the Lord. Wonderful days, the good old days when deeper life members anywhere we find ourselves will preach the word. We're not ashamed of the word of the Lord, not ashamed of the gospel. And I pray that those good old days will come back here. And then you, by the grace of God, in the strength and the power of the Lord, you'll declare the word of God without fear, without favor, in Jesus' name. Actually, that's what, uh, you know, the believers did in the early church before the Sanhedrin. When the Sanhedrin asked Peter and said, by what authority, by what name have you done this? And the Spirit of God came upon him and he said, if we be challenged and ask today, question today, as to by what name authority we have done this? It is by the name of that Jesus Christ whom you crucified, but God raised him from the dead. That is the cheap cornerstone that was rejected of the 
builders, of you builders. It was so confrontational, so direct. And the same spirit the Lord wants to give us today. You remember Stephen, the first matter in the church, when he said, okay, what do you have to say to this? And he said, men, brethren, and the people of Israel. And he began to tell them the history of the people of Israel. And then he came to verse 7 to verse 51 of um, Acts of the Apostles. After he said, now ye stiff necks and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always receive the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. You see, those people were not cowards. That's how those 12 people, those 120 people, those 3,000 people, that's how they took the gospel, the word of God everywhere because there was no fear in them. And that's the same thing we need to have today. We're going to have it in Jesus' name. That we will be able to stand and when you need to correct and rebuke the sinners outside there, you'll be able to do that. But sh- wait a moment. If we're not even able to, if we're not able to correct members of our families and we're so afraid, you're afraid of your little son, you're afraid of your little daughter, and you know that this is the way of salvation, this is the way of God, and you cannot even say this is the way of God, so much afraid of a teenager, your own child. How will you be able to face outsiders and tell them, thus says the Lord? And wait a moment, if you're not able to talk to your wife, your own wife, the husband is a head of the home and your wife is going the way that is not right that will not lead her to life eternal and then you say well I cannot talk I don't want any trouble because if you if you talk now there will be storm in the cup of tea and because of that you cannot talk if you cannot talk to the one inside there how can you talk to the ones outside if you cannot talk to your husband your husband and two of you shall be one flesh and you see that the man is going the wrong way it's going the way of sin the way of perdition and you cannot save a soul from perdition how will you be able to talk to the people outside and those of us who are pastors if we're so much afraid of the workers we ourselves appoint the workers we ourselves raised up the workers we ourselves will say do this and do that and we cannot even help them to get to heaven and we cannot say brother you cannot do that sister that is not right you cannot rebuke the people that ought to be rebuked how can you then go before Belshazzar and then go and tell Belshazzar here is the word of the Lord you didn't need to humble yourself if we cannot talk to members of the church you cannot rebuke them those of the same household of faith you cannot talk to the people that believe in the Bible. They believe in Jesus Christ. They believe in the Holy Ghost. They have a desire to get to heaven. And they're looking for somebody to show them the way to heaven. You cannot even talk to them. How will you talk to the foreigner, to the Belshazzar? How will you talk to the one, the Gentile? That's why the Lord is telling us what we need today is the spirit of Daniel. I will have it. I said we'll have it so that we'll not just turn the eyes, turn our face the other way when you see people who are doing something wrong, something they shouldn't do. And then you become ashamed of the gospel. You become afraid of the gospel and you cannot share the word of God. That will not happen to you. We're looking at Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. In Mark chapter 8, I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 34. It says, when he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Look at verse 38. It is very important. Whosoever therefore, whosoever therefore, whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. 
That is to see other people doing wrong, committing sin, going the way of hell, following the broad way to perdition. And the Lord has given you the word of salvation that they should repent and return from their sin. And you cannot talk to them because you are afraid, because you are ashamed. He said, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me in this adulterous generation, the Son of Man shall be ashamed of him when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I pray God will not be ashamed of me. I pray Jesus will not be ashamed of you. Well, if he is not going to be ashamed of you, you have to have this at the back of your mind and stand to the truth every time in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, I'm reading to you from verse 16. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, for I am not ashamed. Are you ashamed? I said, are you ashamed? If you are not ashamed, are you afraid? No, tell me right. Are you afraid? No. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so we find Daniel, and we're back to Daniel now. Daniel chapter 5. Here Daniel was able to stand, standing for the truth. And then he told this monarch, he told this proud, blasphemous, profane, profligate king that... He ought to have humbled himself, and thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of, the, of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, thy concubines have drunk in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold and of brass, iron, wood and stone, which see not and nor hear nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. He laid it on him and was very clear. I was looking at Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10. He had not humbled himself. And we find many people like that who have not humbled themselves before the Lord, even after the Lord had dealt with them in different ways. Exodus chapter 10 verse 3. Exodus chapter 10 verse 3. And Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, the Lord God of the Hebrews, how long will thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. You are not called to even challenge a Pharaoh. And yet these men of God were courageous enough, were bold enough to challenge a Pharaoh. And how about you then, your neighbors preaching to them? For how long have you been living in that place now? Two years, three years, seven years? And you have not been able to open your mouth and talk to them of the way of life. Because you say, ah, those people, their thoughts, their hooligans... And I know what they can do. I'm afraid for my life. You're ashamed of the Lord then. And Jesus said, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me here in this adulterous generation, I will be ashamed of when I come in the kingdom of my Father. Whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, we are told to courageously declare the word of God unto the people. In Second Chronicles chapter 33. Second Chronicles chapter 33. I'm reading to you there from verse 11 33 11 in second chronicles chapter 33 verse 11 wherefore the lord brought unto them the captains of the host of the king of assyria which took manasseh among the sons and bound him with fetters and carried him to babylon and when he was in affliction he besought the lord his god and humbled himself greatly before the god of his father and he prayed unto him and he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to jerusalem into his kingdom then manasseh knew that the lord 
he was God. If you tell them, they remember that word when eventually they get into trouble. And if you tell them, if they don't humble themselves, then their blood is not upon you anymore. You have delivered your own soul. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel chapter 2, I'm reading to you there from verse 3. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 3. And he said unto me, son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to the rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They they and their fathers have transgressed against me, even to this very day, for they are impudent children and stiff and stiff hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus says the Lord God. You see that even though the Lord knew that those people were difficult people, rebellious people, stiff hearted people, and they stiffened their necks all the same, the message was still to be preached unto them. And the Lord said, Ezekiel, go and tell them. Go and tell them. Thus says the Lord in verse 5, and they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they a rebellious house, yet shall know that there has been a prophet among them. You know the excuse that people give in their fear? The excuse they give is, I know the people will not listen. I know they are not going to respond. I know they are not going to yield their lives to Christ. What's the point? Going to them and talking to them when I know they are not going to yield. The Lord said, that's none of your business. Just tell them the word. Reach out to them with the word. And tell them whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. And so the Lord is saying, don't think about uh, what their attitude will be, what their reaction will be. Declare the word of God. I I pray that God will help you to declare that word. I say God will help you to declare that word. In verse 6, and thou son of man, be not afraid of them. That's what the Lord is telling you today, telling me today, and telling us together today. Be not afraid of them. Neither be afraid of their words. Though they be, do briars and thorns be with thee. And though thou dost dwell among scorpions. Think about that. Even though they might be as poisonous as, as, poisonous as scorpions, all the same, you must declare the word of God unto them. You must Fear God more than you fear any man. In fact, the fear of man brings his near. You mustn't have any fear for any man. And then it says, be not afraid of their words. And be not, be not dismayed at their looks. Though they be rebellious as. And thou shalt speak my words unto them. Whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. For they are most rebellious. But thou son of man. Hear what I say unto thee. And be not thou rebellious. Like the rebellious house. Open thy mouth. And eat that I give thee. We are coming to chapter 3 of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 3. I am reading from verse 7. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee. For they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard hearted. In verse 9. As an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not. Neither be dismayed at their looks. Though they be a rebellious house. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all the words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart, and hear it with thine ear, and go and get thee to them of the captivity of the children of thy people, and speak unto them, and tell them, Thus says the Lord God. Tell me the rest of verse 11. Whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. And the Lord has given us the same commission today. And he has said, go and tell them, go and tell them, go and tell them of the word of life. Rebuke them, correct them, tell them to repent, caution them, warn them, and bring them to the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ that they may repent. Whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. Look at verse 17, son of man. I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely die and thou givest him not warning or speaker to warn the wicked from the wicked, from his wicked way to save his life. 
The same wicked man shall die. In his iniquity, he bought his blood will I require at your hand. I pray will not be guilty of the blood of the wicked. But yet he thou want the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way. He shall die. In his iniquity, he bought thou hast delivered thy soul again. In verse 20, when a righteous man does turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and at least stumbling block before him, he shall die because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require than hand nevertheless. In verse 21, if thou warn the righteous man, that the righteous man sin not, and he does not sin, you will not sin. He shall surely live because he is one. Also thou hast delivered thy soul. And that's what the Lord is telling us. He's telling us to go and tell them to go and warn them. Whether they will hear, whether they will forbear. If they refuse to learn from perceived judgments, then the judgment of God will be heavy upon them. Isaiah chapter 26 verses 9 and 10. Isaiah chapter 26 verses 9 and 10. We're supposed to learn. Learn from the judgments that were seen on Nebuchadnezzar, were seen on Pharaoh, were seen on the Amalekites, were seen on the Philistines, were seen on Sodom and Gomorrah, and all the judgments were seen upon Capernaum, upon all Chorazin, and all those places where Jesus Christ declared his watch unto them. And then he brought the judgment upon them because they were not listening, because they were not repenting after he had done so great miracles before them. And so the Lord is telling us, number one, you must be want yourself so that you're not going the way of sin after you've seen all these dealings of god with the people of the past and then too you'll go out and warn the people that they will not continue in sin i said chapter 26 verse 9 with my soul have i desired thee in the night yea with my spirit within me will i seek thee early for when thy judgments are in the earth you see that when thy judgments are in the earth at the time, in the period, when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. And that's what those judgments are supposed to do. They're supposed to make us learn, learn the righteousness of God because we know that God is not an indulgent God. He still judges sin. And because he judges sin, that's the reason why we ought to fear God and go in the way of righteousness. Not only that, that's the reason we need to warn the people that are still living in sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Now that we know that judgment will come, what are we going to do about that? And what are we going to do for our neighbors? Since we know that the judgment of God will definitely come on those who continue in sin. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord will persuade men. Knowing therefore the terror, the judgment, the fiery indignation of God against sin and sinners. Because of that, we persuade men. We come to point number three, recompense for reprobates living under perpetual judgment. Recompense for reprobates living under perpetual judgment. We're, good. we're going back to Daniel, Daniel chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 5, we're looking at verse 24. Daniel 5 verse 24. In verse 24, it says, Then... Was this part for the part of the hand sent from him? And this writing was written. Then, that word then has the meaning of therefore. What's Daniel saying? Because thou hast not humbled thy heart, therefore this writing was written. What's the implication of what he said? Because thou knewest all this. You knew what came upon your royal father, upon Nebuchadnezzar, and yet you have not taken warning. Yet you have sinned against clear knowledge of his will. Therefore, the handwriting was written. He's saying, because thou hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, in whose hand your breast is. Therefore, this writing was written. 
It was telling him that it's a consequence of what you knew you didn't take note of because that was not glorified God whose are all thy ways, therefore this writing was written. In his pride, Belshazzar denied God his dignity and he defiled the vessels of divine worship. In his pride, he brought the most high God beneath the worthless idols of the earth. In his pride, he praised the gods that see not, they see nothing. He placed the, those gods above the God who sees and knows and hears and does everything. In his pride, he exalted gold and silver, brass and wood and iron and stone above the God, the creator. And in his pride, he had no gratitude for God, his creator, his preserver, his benefactor, his owner. And and his ruler, the most high God held his breath in his hand, and yet he did not regard him. The most high God held his soul in life, and yet he did not have any remembrance of this most high God. The most high God now writes bitter things against Belshazzar, and was frightened, and his knees were knocking together. The final damnation for Belshazzar was reaching on the wall of his palace. He was troubled. And if the writing of the present punishment so troubled him that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees much one against another, what effect will the reality of the eternal perpetual punishment have upon him? And that's the reason why we need to take note today before it becomes too late. And we need to fear this God of heaven. In fact, the reason why all these things are being taught and we're learning them is so that we'll not go the way of Belshazzar. And I pray you'll not be like Belshazzar. And the punishment and the judgment that came upon him will not come upon you in Jesus' name. In Job chapter 36, Job chapter 36, I'm reading from verse 18. Because there is wrath, beware. Because there is judgment, beware. Because God is not asleep, beware. Because God is still God who, is, who says, I'm God, I change not. It's still the same. As it was in the past, even so he is today because of that, beware. It says, because there is wrath, there's judgment, there's indignation, beware, lest it take thee away with a stroke. Then a great ransom cannot deliver the, in the case of Belshazzar, the day of grace was over. The, great, the day of repentance was over. And the day to make amends, that was over. He had misspent and misused the day of grace and the day of opportunity. And repentance was no more. I pray it will not happen to any one of us like that. Will he esteem the riches? No, not gold, nor all the forces of strength. Desire not the night when people are cut off in their place. Take it, regard not iniquity, for this hast thou chosen rather than affliction. In Isaiah chapter 13, Isaiah chapter 13, we're reading from verse 11. Isaiah 13, verse 11. And I will punish the world for their evil. That's the reason we need to take note. And we need to know that recompense is coming. Indignation, wrath, judgment is coming upon the doers of evil. And because of that, we need to watch. I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of offer. Therefore, I will shake the heavens. And the earth shall remove out of her place, and in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. It's just reminding us that judgment is coming, and those who have rejected, refused the gospel, they'll face the judgment of God. Because of that, we need to be afraid of the judgment that is coming, and flee from the wrath to come. In Romans chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 18. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 for the wrath of god is revealed from heaven 
the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. There, there are some people, whenever they read about all these judgments in the Old Testament, or they say, that, that was the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament was a God of judgment. And then they say, the God of the New Testament is a God of love and mercy and compassion and grace. And they forget the a war that came upon the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They forgot the war, the judgment that came upon Jonas Iscariot. And they forgot the judgment that came instantly, immediately upon Herod. They forgot the judgment that came upon Ananias and Sapphira. They forget the judgment that was pronounced upon Simon in Samaria. And many of them, they, they, they think that, well, there's nothing to it today. God is the God of love. In the New Testament, God is still the same God. He judges sin. They forget all those plagues that will be coming upon the world at it, in the time of the revelation. That is during the time of the Antichrist. And so don't, don't join those people that say this is New Testament. It's all love and mercy and grace. And then God is an indulgent father today. He doesn't judge sin anymore. Verse 18 of Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth. How do they hold the truth? In unrighteousness. Well, they even know a little of the Bible, but the little of the Bible, they know they hold it and they still keep in their unrighteousness. They know some of the doctrines of the Bible and those uh, doctrinal truths they know, they still hold it with unrighteousness in them. That's why it's saying that judgment will come upon them because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it unto them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even is eternal power and godhead so that they are without excuse remember Belshazzar he was without excuse he knew what came upon his father Nebuchadnezzar he knew the judgment that came because of the pride and the profanity and the and the exaltation self exaltation haughtiness of that royal father and now he was without excuse it says in verse 20 one because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither was thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. In fact, it goes on to say in verse in verse twenty six for this for this cause God gave them up. Because they knew the right thing and they wouldn't do that right thing, God gave them up. Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up. In verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. When God gives somebody up, that means it's over. No more grace, no more mercy. No more opportunity. The love of God eludes that person. God gave them up. I pray he will not give you up. We're looking at uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We're looking at verses 5 and 6. Ephesians 5. Verses 5 and 6. For this you know, that no monger, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance, any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Don't let anybody deceive you. This is New Testament age, New Testament a period dispensation no more judgment god overlooks everything today grace covers it all let no man deceive you with vain words for because of these things cometh the wrath of god upon the children of what of disobedience second peter chapter 3 verse 7 second peter chapter 3 we're reading from verse 7 but the heavens and the earth, which are when? Now, at this time, New Testament time. The heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Why are people so blind to the truth? And they're saying, New Testament, New Testament, New Testament. Love, mercy. 
God is not an indulgent God, indulgent Father. He overlooks everything that is done. Even if you speech on his face, he doesn't mind anymore. Of course he minds. He still judges sin. And then we're told in verse, in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works which are that are therein shall be burnt up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation? Session and godliness, you know, because of those uh, things that are going to happen, and that's what the Lord is telling us, we need to flee from the judgment to come, so that judgment will not catch up on any of us in Jesus' name. What's the conclusion of all these things we're looking at in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, we're reading from verse, from verse 13, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. We've been talking about Belshazzar. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. We've seen the judgment that came upon Pharaoh, upon the Amalekites, upon the Philistines, upon those Gentiles that occupied the land of Canaan before the children of Israel came in. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. We've heard about Nebuchadnezzar. We've heard about the Babylonians. We've heard about uh, the people in those old days. Now let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. We've come to the New Testament and we've learned that they that know the will of the Father, the will of the Master, and they do not do it, they'll be beating with stripes, and those who know and they don't do, that they'll be beating with many stripes. I have mentioned the case of, uh, of Herod, and the case of uh, Anna and Sapphira, and the case of all those people who have been under the judgment of God. And we have said that God is not an indulgent God today, He judges sin. What's the conclusion of the whole thing? If you live in sin and remain in sin, what's the conclusion? If you continue to rebellion, what's the conclusion? But if you will turn away from your sin and say, Lord, I repent, I do not want to wait until it becomes too late, what will be the conclusion? Look at this. Let us hear now the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments for this the whole duty of man. Every time you wake up, you say, now I remember the judgment of God in the past upon those people that lived in sin and they died in sin. I don't want that to happen to me. So my whole duty is number one, fear God. Number two, keep his commandments. For God shall bring how many works? Tell me out loud. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. But, you know, the possibility is still there today to have forgiveness for every sin you have ever committed. And you can flee from the judgment of God. You can run away from the judgment of God so that the judgment of God will not come upon your life. If you're still living in sin, if you have not been born again, if your life is still a sinful life in the secret, you can still come to the Lord today and say, Lord, I repent. Lord, I turn. At this day of opportunity, Lord, I turn. And then you'll flee from the wrath to come in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 7. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Who has warned you to flee? The reason we're learning all this is so we can be warned, and so we can flee from the judgment to come. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat, for repentance. In Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading verse 3. Hebrews chapter 2, we're looking at verse 3. Now the opportunity is there to repent. The opportunity is there to turn away from sin. The opportunity is there to come to Christ. The opportunity is there to be forgiven. The opportunity is there to have all your sins forgiven and forgotten. The opportunity is there for you to have salvation. And then the power to go and sin no more. The opportunity is there for you to seek the face of the Lord and have that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The opportunity is there for you tonight to have your name in the book of life. 
if you reject, if you neglect, if you overlook, if you gloss over that and you spawn that and say, I don't want that, how will you escape the judgment of God? In Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The opportunity to get saved. The opportunity to call on the name of the Lord. And the opportunity to have all your sins forgiven by the precious blood of the Lamb. Cleansing you, washing you, purging you, purifying you. And then so blotting away all your sins that they will not be remembered again. What a great opportunity for salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Which are the force began to be spoken of by the Lord. And was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. We will not reject the salvation. We will not neglect the salvation. For those who have been saved, hold on and be steadfast. And then move on, get sanctified and get filled with the Holy Ghost. And then be used as a great mighty instrument in telling other people the way of salvation. And for those who are yet to be saved, the opportunity is there tonight. Why not? Why not? Why not call upon him now and have that salvation? The door is open. You can enter in. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The opportunity is there. Belshazzar did not have that opportunity. Why would you not have that opportunity? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Come to Christ. Come to the Lord. And he will take all your sins away. Come to the Lord. He will forgive you. He will totally cleanse you and forgive you. And all those sins will be totally forgotten. You can open your mouth and pray. Are you a backslider? Have you turned away from the Lord? Have you gone back to those things you won't forsook? If you build again those things so once destroyed, you make yourself a transgressor. You make yourself a backslider. You make yourself some a criminal in the sight of the Lord. But you can come back and say, Lord, I am sorry. I give myself all over to you again. Backsliders, you can come back. Why do you wait, brother, sister? Why do you tarry so long? Your Savior is waiting to give you a place in a sanctified throne. Why not now? Why not now? Why not come to him now? The Lord is calling you. Say, you can come. You can come. You can come. And the Lord will forgive you. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. 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 A man. A woman. A sinner. A backslider. A member of the church. A worker of the church. Anybody. As you see that your life. If you've gone astray, you built up again the things you once destroyed. Now you have condemnation, and now you have the guilt, and now you have the judgment of God hanging on your neck, hanging on your head. You can come. Why not now? Why not now? You can come unto the Lord right now, and the Lord will forgive you. He'll take away your sin. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, that's you. Whosoever, that's you. Whosoever, that's you. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved saved. Why not come to him now? Why not come to him now? You're held in captivity by a particular sin. The cord of your sin is binding you. Holding you down. And then you see that you're not able to even deliver yourself. It's like you're now in bondage, in captivity to sin, into evil. Maybe the sin of the flesh, fornication, adultery. A man, a woman has held you in captivity. And if you continue like that, it's going to be hell fire forever and ever. Why don't you come to the Lord today and say, Lord, I repent. Lord, I repent. I give myself unto you. And the Lord will forgive you. And the Lord will change everything. He'll break the yoke and all those effectors of sin, the Lord will break everything. He has power and he is able to save to the uttermost the vilest of sinners, the chiefest of sinners, the greatest of sinners. Yes, he will save. Yes, he will save. He will forgive you and then he'll give you the power to go and sin no more. And then the grace of God will help you to keep in righteousness in holiness for the rest of your life and he'll save you and deliver 
deliver you from the fear of all your enemies and then he'll make you to serve him in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of your life yes he can yes he can you can come to the lord and ask him for the grace of god today what do you hope to gain brother sister by further delay you're holding back you're delaying what are you going to gain by that refusing to pray refusing to yield yourself to the lord at this time of opportunity when you can be saved when your sins can be forgiven there is no one else that can save you except jesus christ there's no other way but he is he is the way and the life and the truth and you can come today and say lord here am i here am i i need to be saved i need my sins to be forgiven and the lord will do it you can say purge me purge me wash me whiter and i shall be whiter than snow and restore to me the joy of your salvation and take not your free spirit away from me uphold me by your spirit by your mighty hand and then when i have that assurance of salvation i'll be able to go and tell sinners this is the way of the lord and you'll bring many sinners to the lord do you not feel my brother his spirit now striving within you his spirit now calling you his spirit now dragging you his spirit now pulling you why not accept his salvation and throw off your burden of sin why not why not why not come to him now why not why not why not come to him now the lord is waiting for you the lord is waiting for you he specializes in saving sinners he specializes in restoring backsliders his love is so great and so high and so broad and so deep and his love will not allow you to perish if you will come to the lord then the lord will save you the lord is not willing that any should perish but at all should come to repentance why will you not come to him now why you not yield now why are you going to wait like belshazzar until it becomes too late too late too late to be saved too late to get to heaven too late to have a renewal too late to have transformation of your life too late to have the power to go and see no more too late to have the victory why are you going to wait why don't you come now why don't you come now why don't you give yourself to the lord now and say lord i'm not going to wait anymore why do you wait the harvest is passing away your savior is longing to save you there is danger and death in delay there's danger and death in delay you can come to the lord now you can say lord i come lord i come and you say that comments unto me i will in no wise cast away if you come to the lord now he will not cast you away if you come to the lord now he will accept you and you come just as you are just as you are the prodigal son came back and the lord received him and every sinner that came to the lord jesus christ he received them he did not cast them me well, why don't you come now and say lord i come lord i come lord i come i'm going to give myself completely unto you learn your lesson you've seen how god judged the people of the past who lived in sin who remained in sin you've seen how the indignation of god the wrath of god came upon them and you want to tell the lord i'm not going to wait like belshazzar until that judgment will fall that judgment will come because here is the conclusion of the whole matter fear God and keep his commandments because God has set a day in the which he will judge the secrets of men by the gospel that we are hearing. You can come to the Lord and say, Lord, I repent. Lord, I return. Lord, I return. Lord, I return. I return unto you. I give myself unto you. And the mercy of the Lord is waiting for you. The mercy of the Lord is waiting for you. Remember when the people of Nineveh they had the word from Jonah and then they call upon the name of the Lord and they abandoned their evil ways, the violence in their hands. The Lord had, had mercy on them and that mercy of the Lord is available for you, for me, for everyone today. Why don't you come now? Why don't you come now? Why don't you come now? Why don't you come to the Lord now? He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will save you. He will give you a very definite experience of salvation. You will never be the same in your life. He will make you a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. All the old habits of sinning, the old habits of doing evil, that you are helpless and powerless, in captivity to sin and evil. The Lord will break that yoke. He will give 
you the power to live in righteousness, in holiness consistently all the days of your life. Tell the Lord, oh Lord, I come. Oh Lord, I come. Oh Lord, I come. And the Lord himself, the Lord himself will have mercy upon you. He will not forget his promise. He will not forget his word. He has said, Whosoever shall come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. It depends on you if you will come at the right time. If you will come at this time now, while the mercy, while the door of mercy is still open, while the grace of God is still flowing, while Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Redeemer is waiting for you, and while other people are getting saved and they're having the sins forgiven, while other people are having the witness of the spirit of God in their heart and they say, oh Lord, I thank you. Oh Lord, I thank you. My sins are forgiven. My life is turned around. I'm changed. Why that grace of God is flowing freely? Why don't you come? Why don't you tell the Lord, oh Lord, I come. And I know you are not going to reject me as I come. And then as you are saved, all those children of God, you have the assurance you are born again. You have the assurance that has sanctified you, purified you, and has made you holy and you have the assurance that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord he has granted it unto you then why don't you have the courage the courage to stand firm and the courage to declare that God wants to save sinners through the Lord Jesus Christ why will you be trembling before his sinner Daniel did not tremble before Belshazzar Daniel declared unto Belshazzar and even rebuked him at the day of his own father that is of Nebuchadnezzar Daniel was not afraid he told him how to repent he told him to break off his sin by righteousness you too shall stand boldly and then you should declare that god wants to save your neighbors tell your neighbors jesus says tell those in the bus jesus says Tell those in the taxi at the bus stop, Jesus saves. Tell those all around you, Jesus saves. Tell your friends, Jesus saves. And tell your co-tenants, Jesus saves. Don't be ashamed, don't be ashamed. Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my word. In this adulterous generation, of him shall I be ashamed when I come in the glory of my Father. You don't want the Lord to be ashamed of you. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth of the Jew force and also of the Gentile. And you can talk to your neighbors. You can tell to your, talk to your friends. You can talk to evil strangers and you can tell them, tell them to escape from the judgment of God. Tell them they can come to the Lord and they can repent of their sins they can turn to the lord and the mercy of god the grace of god will reach them at the point where they are you can talk to those sinners don't they don't don't abandon them and don't say i know they will not hear i know they will not listen don't worry about that whether they will hear or whether they will forbear declare unto them the way of salvation you are that son of man you are that daughter of man i've made you a watchman over the house of israel therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me and you tell the wicked the soul that sinneth it shall die and then you tell them but God is a God of mercy and is willing to save them if you will tell them and assure them of the mercy and the grace of God as they come they will be saved as they come their lives will be turned around you can talk to those sinners make up your mind make a commitment you are going to talk to the sinners you meet the sinners you meet anytime anywhere it's your responsibility it's your duty the lord has made you a watchman and the lord has given you his word of the great commission going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved he that believeth not shall be damned you need the power of god seek that power of god you shall receive power after that the holy ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses not to me both in jerusalem and judea and in samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth and the early church had that power and they that was scattered abroad they went everywhere preaching the word and as you go out today and tomorrow and this week going everywhere scattered everywhere and preaching the word and many many people turn to the lord even people that are priests they turn to the lord and it says a great number of the priests turned unto the lord and you can make them turn to the lord preach to them passionately preach to them courageously and preach to them enthusiastically be excited about it and preach
preach the word effectively. Preach the word. Be instant in season. And out of season, rebuke, reprove. And then make them to come to know the Lord. And remember, remember, and this is what I'm going to tell them. They can repent now. They can repent now. They must not delay. As you have not delayed, he'll tell them not to delay. Why not? Why not? Tell them, why not? Come to him now. You have come to him yourself. And you're staying with him yourself. And you want to bring other people to come to him. And when they come, his promise is sure. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Compel them to come in. Bring them in. And great will be your reward here on earth and there in glory land in heaven.